kind of battle in the building. And uh, she's here to uh, help us. We're pulling together uh, the framework for our first church-wide publication. It's going to be on the DNA of the way and just capturing many of your voices and others' voices that make our church so special. And uh, she's helping us to, to, to write and get testimonies and pull that together. So we had a great time of, of writing and, and planning yesterday with about 10 or so folks from the church. And so, uh, of course, since she's here, uh, she's going to preach the word of God. So come on, stand to your feet, everybody. Put your hands together. Let's welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Pastor. Like, I don't care how tired I am, like the night before or the morning of, as soon as I step foot into this building and I encounter the people of the way, I'm trying to tell you, it does something for my soul. So thank you. Amen. For the energy and the love in this space. Well, um, in the interest of time, we're going to press on. We're after the 10 o'clock hour, and I was told that that clock doesn't work, and so... I will not be paying attention to that lest we be here longer than we need to. I am a Baptist preacher. Amen. <laughs> but I give God thanks and praise because God is amazing. As always, I give God thanks and praise for some of the greatest gifts in my life. The gift of Dedrick Battle and the gift of my children and the gift of um, my family and my friends, my brother Mike, my sister Sharice. I am thankful um, and it is always a privilege and an honor to preach anywhere I go, but it is not one that I ever take lightly. It doesn't get easier to prepare. It does not get easier um, in the process. And so I believe that that is God's way of keeping a sister humble and um, a little bit scared. Amen. Amen. So um, the scripture is going to come up. We're going to look today at um, Exodus chapter three. For some of you, it may be a fairly familiar passage of scripture um, as we look at Moses and we engage this conversation around igniting in 2019. It reads as follows, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to the good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, and the Hivites, and the Jezebites. And the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He says, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall worship God on this mountain. I can't see over there. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, thus shall you say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt into the land of the... Oh, have we already read that? No, okay. Hivites and the Jezebites in the land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us now go a three days journey to the wilderness so that they may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. I will bring his people into such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Mm. Each woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman living in the neighbor's house for the jewelry of silver and gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God, the lessons of an unconsuming fire. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, our minds are often pulled in so many ways, and so it is never inappropriate to not stop and ask you to silence us and censure us. No matter how many times we have to ask God, we will ask over and over and over again, and that God, there's no more sacred moment than when we are gathered with you and with your people in worship. And so we ask that in this moment, God, that you center us and silence any voice within us that we may hear you clearly. Make us keen to the sound of your voice. Make our hearts receptive that we may be transformed, that we may transcend the things that cause us not only pain, but that cause us to stumble on this journey. God, that we may be encouraged to press on and to say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There are certain things that we can encounter in life that are just based upon natural law. So for example, we wake up and the trees are growing from the ground, that's natural law. The birds are flying from the air. We eat mac and cheese and it just is mouthwatering. That's natural <laughs> law. But when things that normally abide by natural law, for whatever reason, are no longer abiding by natural law, we have to pause and we have to ask, is something supernatural, is something extraordinary or even divine at play? So, for example, if we wake up and the trees are hanging from the sky or the birds are crawling on, on the ground or we sit at our mommies or our aunties or our grandma's table and we are eating mac and cheese from a box, or mac and cheese that's, eat, that's made by Velveeta, right? You have to kind of pause and say, is it me, or did they make this mac and cheese with imitation cheese, right? It's unnatural. Like, is God trying to tell me to stop eating mac and cheese? But then there are times, there are times when what should be natural feels like it's supernatural. The brother um, Kamal Ball, who, um, Bell, who has a comedy show on Netflix, tells a, a story about his daughter who loves Doc McStuffins. So for those of you who don't know Doc McStuffins, Doc McStuffins is a Disney character. She's a little black cartoon character who um, goes around fixing and, and she is a doctor to her toys. And she is imitating her mother who is an actual doctor in the show. Well, also during like commercial breaks of the show, Disney has chosen to actually um, show real life examples of black women 
who are doctors. And so Kamal says, you know, his daughter loves Doc McStuffin, and so she began to correlate doctors with black women. So much so, right? What a beautiful norm. So much so that when she goes to the doctor and a white male doctor walks in, she is visibly disturbed. <laughs> He says she is so caught off guard that she finds a very respectful but sly way to let them know that she is not pleased <laughs> and that she is not okay with this man touching her, right? This is a beautiful norm for a little black girl to have, but the truth and the reality is this, she is the exception. That most little black and brown children would see a black or brown woman as a doctor as an extraordinary thing, almost miraculous or supernatural. This interplay between the natural and the supernatural is at the heart of our passage today. Moses is born to a Hebrew slave, is given up in order to save him. He is raised by Pharaoh's daughter with a semblance of privilege he grows up to be a young man. He sees a slave who looks like him being beaten by a soldier. In his uncultivated sense of justice and rage, he kills this soldier and flees. He finds himself in the land of Midian, meeting a man who is a Midian priest by the name of Jethro, marries his daughter Zipporah, and here is where we find ourselves several years later in the passage that we just read. He is herding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and he moves off the beaten path. He moves into uncharted territory, past the wilderness, up to the mountain of God known as Horeb. And while he is there, he sees a bush that is ablaze, but is not being consumed by the fire. Now, those of us who live in California, we are very well aware of the destruction of fire can cause. And so Moses knows this is so odd, and he is intrigued. And so he says, let me turn aside. Let me look for just a second at this great event. And as he begins to move closer, God calls out to him, Moses, Moses. In other words, deliverer, deliverer. How Interesting it is that our call is usually already in us. It just needs to be called out. Ooh. Deliverer, deliverer. He says, don't come any closer. Take off your shoes, your own holy ground. And then God introduces God's self. He says, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses is now afraid because he does not want to look at the face of God lest he die. And so God says to him, he says, look, Moses, I have heard the cries of my people. I see their oppression, and I am sending you to deliver them. Moses, perhaps, you know, who is now in a very humbled position considering the trajectory of his life. Perhaps he's remembering what happened the last time he left Egypt. And he says, um, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and deliver your people? God says to him, don't worry about all that. I will be with you. They engage in this conversation around what he is to say if the people ask how, um, how they are to know that he is from God and if they ask what God's name is. So they have this huge discourse around what he is to do and what he is to say. And then God says to him, I will give the people favor, so much favor that when they go and ask for very prized possessions, <coughs> that it will be given freely they will plunder the Egyptians. So much about this passage is really um, situated around the power of God, right? That is at the core. That is the overarching thing. God is a powerful God. And yet I believe that as we engage this theme around um, ignite or igniting um, as it regards our passions, our gifts, our call, 
I think there are some lessons that are that we can extract from this text in the next few minutes that can kind of help us um, provide a framework for how we are to think about this thing, a framework for what we are to remember as we begin to actually find the courage to say yes. The first lesson I think that this passage teaches us is how to ask the right question. It teaches us how to ask the right question. So here we have Moses, born to a slave, abandoned in order to, um, for his life to be saved, but abandoned nonetheless. He lives in a home with people of a certain measure of, um, of privilege, but these are people who are not his people. He is like an outsider. He then murders a man. He flees to another country that is not his own. He marries a woman and is now tending the flock of his father-in-law. Now, people say that actually this is a really important point because most men of Moses' age and status in Midian already had their own flock. So it was a very humbling thing for him to still be tending to the flock of his father-in-law. So I want you to think for just a moment how much all of this would have culminated for him, right? Where, what did he have to call his own? Who were his people? Where did Moses belong? And we see this rising up in the question that he asked God when God says, I'm going to send you. He receives the call, and what does Moses say? Who am I? Who am I that I should go? I can remember being a teenager and asking my father um, about his call story. My father was um, a pastor, and he was a preacher. And um, I wanted to know about his call. And this is what my daddy said to me. He says, well, Donna, he says, when I first started kind of discerning and sensing God's call to this specific kind of ministry on my life, he says, I resisted it because I could barely read. He says, and I was convinced that God really needed to choose someone who was formally educated, right? My father only had a high school education, and even then he wasn't reading on a 12th grade level at graduation. He says, so I was doing everything I could to convince God that I was not the one. He says, the moment came, the breaking point for me to say yes came when I drank a fifth of liquor straight and I didn't even get tipsy. <laughs> the supernatural supersedes the natural. <laughs> He's like, I was like, oh, okay. You really calling me because I should be drunk right now. <laughs> Just as sober as I can be. <laughs> but he said he heard so clearly in that moment, God says, I will be with you. He says, I heard God say it. God, I will help you. And I believe that. You know why? Because as he was telling me this story, I had a hard time believing, knowing where he was situated in that moment, that he had struggle to be able to read. I mean, my father had spent all of his life in church. He had been a deacon. He had taught Sunday school. He had taught Bible study. But everything that he knew about scripture, all of the memorization that he had came from what other people had read to him. It came through his experiences. And what he now, or at the time before his death described as, had to be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I could not read it for myself. And by the time he was telling me this story when I was about 15 or 16 years old, there was no indication that at any point in his life he had struggled in that way. I mean, I knew he struggled over a couple of words here or there, but there was no other marker that my father had struggled in the way that he had. God had helped him. And so when Moses says to God, who am I that I should go? Notice what God doesn't do. God doesn't give him a pep talk. God doesn't say, oh, no, Moses, you can do it. You got so many gifts. You're amazing. God doesn't say that. Right? All God simply says is that I will be with you. That your call is predicated not by you, 
but by me. Now, I want to be very clear here. We are not talking about those who act very arrogantly and are very misled in their purpose, right? I'm not talking about, you know, the high-profile brothers who try to inform sisters of what they need to fix and what they need to do in order to find a man and keep a man, right? I'm not talking about the sisters. <laughs> I'm not talking about the sisters who, you know, want to teach all of the rest of us about work-life balance, but they can afford to have a full-time nanny. That is not what I'm talking about, right? We're not talking about misguided purpose. Here we are talking about humble confidence. Here we're talking about the fact that God, in essence, says to Moses, you are asking the wrong question. The question is not, who am I? It should be, who is God? Why? Because it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter that you felt abandoned all your life. It doesn't matter that you grew up in a home that never really accepted you. It doesn't matter what you did that you are ashamed of. It doesn't matter that right now in life you, you see your peers and they're much further along than you feel like you should be. Come on, none of that matters. Because it ain't about you. It ain't about me. The question is not, who am I? Because who cares who I am? The question is, who is God? Which takes us to our second lesson. The second lesson I think that this passage of scripture teaches us is that we are literally visited by the living God. Not figuratively, but literally visited by the living God. So if we continue in this discourse of scripture, if we continue to walk down this discourse, we see the next kind of pericope that they are kind of engaging in, or this next level of conversation that they're engaging in. So now Moses is like, okay, um, the argument of who am I didn't work, right? So he says, yeah, but okay, God. He's like, but if I go before your people and I tell them that I am sent by their God, and they ask me what your name is, what I'm supposed to say, because I don't know what your name is. <laughs> right? Now, let's pause here for just a moment. I want you to listen to Moses' language. Moses says, if I go to the Israelites, if I go to them, as if he is not an Israelite. And if I tell them their God, as if God is not his God. He is still very lost. He is still very much not able to conceive of the fact that this is the God in his presence that belongs to him. This is his God. Right? And so then what does God say to him? Even though, I mean, if we go back to the beginning of the passage, what do we see God do in introduction? God says, I am the God of your father. <laughs> go back and look. He says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Moses didn't catch that. Moses is still saying, you their God. These are your people. Like, he is still very much all by himself. And so God says to him, he says, look, he says, this is what you tell them. He says, you tell them I am that I am. The I am has sent him, sent you. And then he reiterates the very same introduction and tells him to speak it from his mouth that he gave to him at the beginning. He says, you tell them that I am the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What we see here is that Moses is literally in the presence of God, but he cannot conceptualize it. He can't walk in it. He can't own it. This is further exemplified by the presence of flame. Scripturally, flame represents the bodily manifestation of God. The bodily manifestation of God. That means that God was literally there. Now, we grew up hearing that God is in heaven, which means what? God is up there somewhere, right? And we hear this over and over again, even like unconsciously. Somebody dies. Oh, they're going up to heaven, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, we may not believe that 
consciously now, but we must not put aside what happens unconsciously, right? If 95% of our cognitive activity, of our cognitive thoughts are unconscious, then we must also realize that implicit bias does not just apply to racism, and implicit bias does not just apply to sexism and all of these isms. Implicit bias can also apply to how we relate to God and how we understand God. So we hear all our life, God is up in heaven, but when we say God is here, we can't really conceptualize it. When we say God is here, we can't really hold it and own it. Because 95% of our time, we're acting like God is somewhere else. But let's talk about this for just one more second. One more second. Let's stay here for just a little while longer because this is an important point. First Corinthians, Paul says what? The body is the temple of the Lord. It's body. Okay, Jeremiah says what? The word of God is like um, fire in my heart. It's like fire shut up in my bones. Now remember, fire is what? The bodily manifestation of God. What does John, the gospel of John, open by saying? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was what? God. So literally, Fire shut up in my bones is the same thing as saying, this is God shut up in my bones. And what do we know about God? God cannot be contained. God can't be shut up. God can't be limited. God must what? Be free. And so in this moment where God is amid us, And here, God is ubiquitous. God is existing in all places at all times. But if God is here and if God is shut up, God must come out. And so if we are going to ignite the passions within us, ignite this call within us, we are literally welcoming the actual manifestation of God in us to unleash the power of deliverance, to unleash the power of liberation to set free the things we are called to do in this world. But there's one other thing we need to say right here before we move on. We must welcome the presence of God. (laughs) We must welcome the presence of God. Now, in the South, I don't know, maybe other places too, but definitely in the South, If you get an unexpected visitor and it's somebody you really like and you don't mind that they're interested in your day, you go to the door, you see them, you smile, and you say what? Come on in. (laughs) Sit down for a little while. But if somebody comes up to your door and you don't want to engage with them, you don't want to talk to them, like I've had a few of these, you know, our brothers and sisters who know, you know, they go door to door evangelizing or, you know, the salespeople who come by, right? What you going to do? You might stand in the door and you might talk for a little while. The door's still open. You're standing. And you talk a little, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But everything about your body language is saying what? Please leave. <laughs> and have you ever had this experience where you're trying to tell them to leave, but they not catching your cues? It feels disrespectful, right? You feel like, oh, my God, like they not, they not catching the cues that I want them to leave. And in the rare occasion that they actually ignore your actual words that say what? You know what, I'm not really interested, right? They just ignore it like you didn't say it, or you know what, I'm already saved. And then they wanna engage you around your salvation as if your salvation ain't real. I mean, it's all of these things. But every once in a while, I'll have somebody who will literally come up and who will say, well, can I just come in for a minute? And I'm like, mm. It feels like a violation of your person, of your autonomy to choose who's in your space, right? Y'all, God is not such an uninvited visitor. God will always be close. But God will not come in unless you say yes. God is a God of consent. God does not force God's self on us. 
Now, the grace and the love of God always covers us. But when we're talking about this call, when we're talking about this passion, when we're talking about walking in our purpose, you must welcome the manifestation of God in your life. And this shows up in the passage. Go back and look, right? Moses is on the mountain herding the flock. He sees the burning bush, which is God. And what does he do? He turns, right? And what does the scripture say? God does not speak to him until he sees that Moses has turned and is coming towards the tree. <laughs> we must welcome the literal manifestation of God. And if God is within us, God, you know what that means? It means that we are holy. It means that our work is holy. It means that the purpose that we are called to is holy. Welcome the manifestation of the literal God. Finally, I think this passage teaches us that we are supposed to get what's ours. Now, I must admit, when I first read the end of this passage around plunder, I got all giddy inside because I was quite sure I had found the literal <laughs> justification for reparations. <laughs> I was like, ah! They were enslaved, and God said they can plunder. I'm not, you know, I'm not quite yet ready to let go of that, you know. I might, yeah, I'm just not. But I will say that there's more to it than that. <laughs> when I was in seminary, I served a predominantly white congregation down in Tampa, Florida, and one of the parents of the teenagers that was a member of the church asked me if I would be willing to go with her daughter and some of her friends to uh, um, Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, concert and I was like okay you know I'll go it's a free concert I don't have to pay I'll go and so I went and I like Christina Aguilera I like Justin Timberlake enough you know and so <laughs> Christina and Justin you know it was free you know and Christina you know she kind of belts out in her very soulful way like you can see in both of their music the influence of black culture right in a way that that's cool. I, I'm cool with the influence, right? But during Justin's performance, I believe he crossed over a line from influence to appropriation. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm watching and he goes into this bebop session, right? And you know, immediately I'm like cussing in my head. I can't cuss in the church, but I was cussing in my head, right? And I was like, I know. He didn't, right? <laughs> and so, <coughs> again, bebop originating in jazz, then transformed and also taken over by hip hop, right? And so <coughs> he is doing this in a stadium full of young black teenage and young adult girls and women who do not know the his historical um, story of bebop. And so I keep waiting as the stadium, you know, they're like roaring because they're like, oh man, this is so great. They're like up and roar, you know, just on their feet. And I keep waiting for him to pay homage. I keep waiting for him to give credit to the originators. I keep waiting for him to give them a small history lesson. But no, he takes it as if it's his own based upon the space. You see, cultural appropriation is so offensive because it is the inappropriate taking of a practice or something created and shaped or formed by one group, usually by another more dominant group, yeah. right? It is used and for profit, and oftentimes it is a practice or something that is criticized by the dominant group when a marginalized group does it, but it's praised when they do it, right? So don't get me wrong, cultural appropriation rubs us the wrong way. But what if I told you, I believe that we might possibly be called through this passage to get what's ours through a form of appropriation or even restorative appropriation. 
the word plunder in this passage refers to the appropriation of cultural heritage as it regards learning from another heritage or group of people something that you need to improve your life. What if this third lesson of getting what's ours is really about learning what we need to learn even from other people that we may oppose that will help us get to where we need to get to and access what we need to access. The Dalai Lama, I once read a quote by the Dalai Lama who says, we can learn, if we're open, we can learn from anyone, even our enemies, right? And so my cousin um, really talks about this. I have a cousin who is in politics, pretty high up in politics, and you know, he says, you know, he believes his political party needs to learn something from the opposing political party and particularly the ways in which they are ruthlessly strategic in reaching their goals. He's like, we need to mirror that. It's not enough to just be good, right? So what might it look like for us to, to really pay attention? Have you ever noticed how people who are united around their hate, I mean, are locked into solidarity? Like, they don't even have to agree on all the points, but they are always locked into solidarity. What might it mean for us to take a lesson from their page book and how we are locked in our solidarity around love? The same measure, the same press. If we look at this passage of scripture, Moses, <coughs> I find it very odd based upon all the other passages of scripture where people encounter supernatural things and they're what? They're scared, right? They see an angel, they're scared. If I see a bush that's burning and it ain't burning, I'm scared. <laughs> Is it not strange to you that Moses won't scare y'all? He was inquisitive, right? Moses did not hesitate. He was not skeptical, right? He didn't hesitate one minute to move towards God, even though he didn't even know it was God. No questions came up in his mind as to whether or not he should or shouldn't. He didn't go through this whole mental process of, of exhaustion, trying to figure out what he should or shouldn't do. He didn't question, oh my God, should I be here? Maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Am I seeing something I'm not supposed to see? And they gonna ask me, should I? He didn't go through any of those processes, right? And I would attest that that's because he grew up in a household of privilege. He was born to a slave, but that brother grew up in Pharaoh's house. Right? Had a professor in, in my PhD program who was a black woman who says that her husband says that she's the most privileged black woman he ever saw because she will walk into a, a store, literally, he will see people following her around the store and she will be completely oblivious to it because she gives absolutely no mental energy, no t she spends no time expending energy around whether or not people like her, whether or not they see her, whether or not they question her because she's black, whether or not they think she might steal, she doesn't even, she just don't give it no mind. She spends no mental energy thinking about it at all. She says, I got enough concrete things to deal with, not to be letting them up in my mind. And I listened to her story, and I realized that there are some things that we consider privileges or that have become privileges of a few group, groups of people or certain people in certain groups, because everybody in the group don't have the same privilege, right? That really are rights for all of us. Access to freedom, access to safety, access to health care, access to good education. Those are rights that we should all have. Now, granted, what I've just named are things that we must strategically organize around. But what we do have power over are our minds. What we have power over are our inner processes. We can determine whether or not we take a page out of the book of people who are called privileged by saying, you know what, I'm not going to hesitate. Yeah. I see something, doggone it. I'm not going to spend time asking whether or not I'm good enough. I'm not going to spend time asking whether or not I belong here. I'm not going to spend time, even if other people are thinking it. I don't know what's going on in their head. 
guess what? I'm not spending mental energy in that. I'm going to reclaim my peace. I'm going to reclaim my mental health. I'm going to come back to my center, to myself. This thing of learning and garnering what we need is about being able to see people who take what should not be theirs and owning it as if it is. And allowing our response in learning from that, that we are going to now take back what is rightfully ours that never should have been taken. Yeah. Alice Walker, in her book, In Search, yes, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, if you haven't read it, it's a great book, recalls as a young girl the first time she saw the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as the sister has reminded us to make sure we fill in that whole story. And she says she remembers first hearing his name and first thinking, what a weird and strange name as a little girl. But then she says her first image of seeing him was of him being um, arrested and handcuffed and thrust into the back of a police truck. And these were her next words. Can you bring that up? He had dared to claim his rights as a native son and had been arrested. He displayed no fear but seemed calm and serene, unaware of his own extraordinary courage. His whole body, like his conscience, was at peace. Ooh. Peace is not a privilege, y'all. It's a right. And so we find ourselves now at the end where we began. That perhaps... There are things that have been denied to some of us for so long that should be natural that they have come to feel supernatural when we finally receive them. Amen. But you all, a burning bush that is not consumed, a body of water that rises up so that people can walk on dry land, a man who is both fully human and fully divine who dies and is resurrected, that is supernatural. Being free to access what we need, having access to a full, healthy, whole life is not supernatural. It is a God-given right, a right given by the God of our mothers and our fathers, the God of Martin Luther King Jr., of Ella Baker and Paul Lee Walker, the God who sets the captives free. It is given freely by the God of all power. A God who is inviting us to ourselves, inviting us into joy, into peace, and into the power of what it means to walk into our call and our purpose. And we must say yes, because if we don't, the call that God has given to us won't go forth. And what is our call? We are called <coughs> to lead people out of the darkness of bondage into the light of freedom. Learn the lesson and be free. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.